Have you ever had a moment in your life, I call them ecstasy moments, when gratitude, appreciation, love, exhilaration of soul, all just converge to lift you up to almost the ethereal region. Maybe it's when they laid that little boy or girl in your arms for the first time and you looked at them. Or maybe it's when you walked over to their bassinet and looked and thought, I wish you knew how much I love you. Or it's when you get together with folks you expect to live with forever in heaven. You sing together. You pray together. You study God's word together. Ecstasy moments. That's where I am today with all of you. It's just a great blessing to my life. I love Paul and the Don Sane for what they mean not only to this congregation that I'll always love, but what they mean to the cause of Christ generally. And if there's anyone that thinks they appreciate Dan and Diane Winkler more than I do, I sure would love to meet them sometime. But I have profound gratitude and appreciation for these people. And when Jonathan was talking about the dinner you had at Paul and the Don's last night, I thought, man, I wish. I was speaking at Tennessee Bible College in Cookville last night, and so I missed that dinner. But I know I missed a great treat for my life. And for the invitation that brings me here today, I don't take it for granted. It's an honor. It's a joy. It's a privilege. It's an opportunity. And first, I thank God for it. And then I thank Brother Joe Christopher and the elders here for giving me this privilege. I've been blessed to direct the Nashville School of Preaching for 30 years. Next year, God willing, we will celebrate our 50th anniversary of the Nashville School of Preaching. Brother Charles Brewer, Brother Bob's father, and others started that school, and it's still going. And we are doing our best to encourage people to go out and preach and teach the Word of God. Ed Slayton is our dean at school. He preaches for the church at College Grove. Ed told me recently, about a little boy down at that congregation. His parents are faithful members. And Jackson is three and a half years old. And Ed said recently, Jackson came to him and said, Mr. Ed, sometimes I have trouble waiting until you get through. <laughs> well, I hope none of you have trouble waiting until I get through today. But uh, out of the mouth of babes, so I think in terms of privilege and opportunity that God has given me, if, if the Lord wills, the first week of July of this year, for 65 years of my life, God has honored me with the privilege and opportunity of preaching and teaching His Word. And for that, for that I'm eternally in the Lord's debt. Now, if you want to open your Bible with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to look specifically starting in verse 15, and then note a few words after that. We're thinking about the application of truth, and I want to put that by introduction into our current context. We'll look at it from the context of our society, our culture, and then in religion. For a lot of people to talk about truth would be about as skeptical as old Pilate when the Savior said, I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And you could almost hear the cynicism. Pilate said, what is truth? John 18 and 38. You know, that's where we are culturally today in the United States. And it's where a lot of religions are. What is truth? Now, all of this dates back to the early 1900s when a 26-year-old Jewish physicist by the name of Albert Einstein set forth a theory that he called the theory of relativity. The British scholar Paul Johnson in the book Modern Times on pages 5 and 6 said, unfortunately, 
people jumped from relativity over to relativism. And then they concluded there were no absolutes in anything. Time, space, morals, ethics. He said it became a type of knife to cut society adrift from the Judeo-Christian culture. And so secularism that parades around across this country, that is strong in higher education today, that is real in our nation's capital, trying to build upon a philosophy that the only reality is materialism, something that is verified by empiricism, and if you cannot verify it by one of the senses, it's myth, it's not even reality. And this thing of relativism, as Dan mentioned pluralism, and that's the background of it, all religions are basically the same. Now there's a new one coming down the road, a new type pluralism, that's going to be asserting that all religions are equally false. That'll be the new one. And when you think about people today that have the idea there's no such thing as absolute truth, and you will probably meet someone who will be absolutely sure that there is no such thing as absolute truth and never imagine the inconsistency. So when we're talking today about the application of truth, we are assuming that you believe, as I believe, that there is a truth. There is a truth that can be known. There is a truth that can be respected. There is a truth that can be obeyed. And I'm assuming that we all agree with that. Now when you look at this passage, and Paul is writing initially to a young preacher by the name of Timothy. I have been interested in studying what Paul has written in 1st and 2nd Timothy. Ten times he talks about truth in these two inspired documents. But when you look at Paul's letters, they usually right up front will have a type of blessing, grace and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the exceptions to that will be 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. He says to these preachers, grace and mercy and peace be unto you. Why the mercy? Because we are handling the Word of God, the living Word of God, sharper than a two-edged sword. And the sharper the instrument, the more care you have to exercise in handling it. It's dangerous business. No wonder James would say, Be not many teachers, knowing that we shall receive the heavier judgment. James 3, 1 and 2. And so when we think about Paul getting ready to leave this world, in fact, this is his closing epistle, 2 Timothy. And he's going to say over in the latter part of it, over in the close of this letter, the time of my departure is at hand. Now I'm going to hit the pause button for just a minute. I love that expression. Paul didn't say, the time of my destruction, I'm going out of existence. Oh no. The time of my departure is at hand. That's death for a faithful child of God. It's not termination, it's not destruction, it's departure for something far better than we could ever experience on this earth. As he will say to the Philippian church, to depart and be with Christ is far better. Amen. And so I think here in terms of him getting ready to end his work for the Lord on this earth and go to the reward. The time of my departure is at hand. He said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love is appearing. And so as he is trying now finally to say to Timothy, you be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You lay hold on eternal life. You keep your values straight because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You follow after righteousness and peace and joy and things that really, really count. 
And so here in chapter 2 and 15, he says, study, literally bend every effort, exert yourself, study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling a right or literally cutting a straight line with the truth. I want us to think about, first of all, the exciting possibilities here. The exciting possibility of being a worker for the Lord. And you know, when we are working for the Lord, we are putting our stamp on eternity. Now, I believe there's a place in this life for people to have businesses and jobs, providing for their own, and then having some to help those who are in need, as he will tell us in the great Ephesians letter, chapter 4, closing verses. But you know, you could spend a lot of your energy and much of your time building a business, but one day you'll leave it. Those of us who are working for the Lord, and people with businesses can also work for the Lord. Those of us who are working for the Lord, we don't leave it when we die, we go to it. We go to the reward. What an exciting possibility. And so I want us to have an appreciation for the great honor of working for the Lord. Because when I'm working for the Lord, I'm working with the Lord. Isn't that what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, 1? We then as workers together with him, working with the Lord, what an honor. Working for the Lord, what an opportunity and a privilege to put my imprint on the eternal. And so I go to the truth to find out what my work is going to be for the Lord. There is no place in the kingdom for people to imagine there's nothing for me to do. I can't preach. I can't teach a Bible class. I've never had a course in personal evangelism. So I don't know anything to do. Let me take you to a great scripture here in 2 Timothy, latter part of chapter 3, after Paul had told this great young man, from a child you've known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. Then Paul said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is literally God-breathed. This is as much the word of Almighty God as if he came down and orally declared what I find written. This is God-breathed scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, truly or completely furnished unto what? Every good work. Now, have you found your place? There's an old song that said, There's room in the kingdom of God, my brother, for the small things that you can do. Just a small, kindly deed that may cheer another. It's the work God's planned for you. This book right here, this truth revealed, has within its sacred pages information to let me know there is a place for me to serve the Lord. How many times have you sung, if in the temple holy preaching the word, or in homes of the poor and lowly serving the Lord? There have been times I've been sitting outside a hut in Guyana. Gene Johnson knows the experience. Telling a person who has nothing materially that God loves you. Jesus died for you as much as he died for me. Oh, in the homes of the poor and lowly. Now, if this scripture furnishes me unto every good work, it lays out for me the possibilities. 
So I'll just ask you two or three questions. Does the New Testament teach that we are to teach the lost? You said, man, Brother Winkler pointed out one of the great commission statements, go and teach the nations. Well, how do you do that? You do it. And sometimes it's not because you've had a course on how you do it. You just have the motivation to want to do it. It's like I told a man in Texas one time that thought he hated preachers. I was told that that was true. And he'd given some indication that he didn't hate me. So I went out to his ranch one day. And uh, he was in a bunkhouse. He had a home in winters, but he was out at the ranch. And they came out on the porch and invited me to come up and sit with him. And I said, Mr. Ralph, I've come out here to talk to you about your soul. I thought he might say, get in that car and head back to town. He didn't. He, he let me talk to him about his soul. When I got ready to leave, I was standing down at the porch and he stuck something in the lapel of my coat. I thought, well, I didn't see him writing a note. I wonder what he put in there. And I started into town. I pulled out a pretty large bill of money he'd stuck down in my coat. The man that hated preachers. Well, what do you say to a fellow like that? I've said to a few people, if I don't talk to you about your soul, the rocks will cry out. Can you go to a person that you know today that's not faithful to the Lord, that once was baptized into Christ, added by the Lord to his church, no longer for whatever reason, no longer faith? Could you go to that person and say, you know, I've thought so much about you. I've prayed many prayers for you. I want you to come back to our family of God. Could you do that? I mean... You know, it, it's not a professional approach. If, it's just a Christian love approach. Couldn't we all do that? Do you know anyone today that is really, really discouraged for whatever reason? If you do, there is your opportunity. You see, one person's misfortune is my opportunity. And so you have an opportunity here to go to an individual and to do as the Scripture says do. Comfort the downhearted. That's what Paul told that infant church at Thessalonica. Comfort the downhearted. Call them to your side. Speak a word of it. Can you do that? Well, sure we can do that. Well, now what about going to a person that has never been baptized into Christ and just telling them, you know, I have an interest in your spiritual welfare. You and I are going to leave this old world one of these days. We're all headed straight into eternity. And I want to be sure that I'm doing everything I know how to do to urge you to be ready for the journey over on the other side. Could you take your Bible and read to a person what to do to be saved? Well, sure you can. Your Bible's got Acts 2 in it. Just read it to a person. When I was a freshman at Freed Hardeman, when I came home one Friday afternoon, and my daddy told me that there was a man in our community that wanted me to come see him. He had traded at my dad's store, and I'd known this man for years, but he was sick. He was very sick, and he wanted me to come see him. So I went over to his house that Friday afternoon, and he said, he was bedfast. He said, Tom, I'm going to die pretty soon. The doctors told me. Now, I want you to tell me what to do to be saved. I called his name. I said, this is so serious to me. I'm just going to read it to you from the Bible. And I read him the accounts of the Great Commission. And I believe the man understood it. Unknown to me, his wife was standing just outside that bedroom door. And I read it to him. And I said, now, this is what the word of the Lord says. And all of a sudden she spoke up and she said, you don't have to do that. Now his blood's on her hands, not on mine. 
you know, the opportunities for us to work for the Lord, they're all around us. Just a small, kindly deed that may cheer another. Just a word trying to get some unfaithful person to come back and be faithful to the Lord. Trying in, in your own way to get a person interested in obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. At least one person is interested in their soul. And you are that person. I tell you, the opportunities are absolutely unlimited for you to serve. And that's what we're talking about. This is a servant's day. We're emphasizing the importance of serving the Lord, finding my place, finding your place, and doing everything we can to the glory of God as a servant. And on down in the latter part of this chapter, Paul will say to Timothy, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. In meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves. Look at that. Oppose themselves. Have you ever had anybody on your case? Have you ever had anybody really trying to do you in? Really trying to hurt you? I mean, really, really hurt you. He says, you know, there are people that oppose themselves. What if I oppose myself? What if I'm my own worst enemy? That would be nothing short of a tragedy. And so I think in terms, the servant of the Lord. And you know what? If we go out with that attitude, I remember vividly the first time I ever tried to teach a personal Bible class. I, re I had read the books, you know, Knock on That Door, Fishers of Men, name it. I'd read those books, but I'm going to tell you something. When I started walking up that walkway, my heart was pounding, and I thought, they're going to ask me questions I can't answer. It's going to embarrass. Every negative thing the devil could throw at me, he was letting me have it. But you know what I found out? After you do that a few times, it's not all that hard. Just teach a few people personally, and I've, I've used the jewel millifilm strips, you know, uh, that little old chart we used to have, 30 minutes with someone who loves you. Man, I wore one of those out. And I used to write down on, on the back of that little old chart the people that obeyed the gospel when God would let me use that to teach them. If they'd already basically been taught, this was just urging them to go ahead and do what the Lord said do. But my favorite way to study now with people, just open the Bible and get your Bible and uh, let's just open our Bibles. And usually I'm taking references down for them to study later. And uh, I'm telling you, the opportunities are here for us to be servants. And so that's the first thing, is to appreciate the opportunity God has given us to be workmen for Him. Ladies and gentlemen, working for the Lord and going to your reward. Now second. Here's an implication in 2 Timothy 2.15 that we must not neglect nor minimize. He says, you handle aright the word of truth. Now the implication is written all over that. I may not handle the word of truth aright. I may abuse the word of truth. You know, you could have a medication, for example... Let's just say that they really perfected the U-tree medication for cancer. But it doesn't matter if it's perfected. If I don't take it, if I need it, it's not going to do me any good. If there's anything worse than not taking the medication, it's taking the wrong kind of medication. Many years ago, in fact, it was back in the 60s, Early one Sunday morning, I was driving through Huntington, Dan, before they made the bypass, on my way to Kentucky to start a meeting. And as I drove in the southern part, into the southern part of Huntington, out on the driveway, or really the drive under, of a little modest brick house, there were many stands of flowers. Obviously, a funeral. They were getting ready for a funeral. Later I asked Brother Ben Holliday, told him about what I'd seen. I said, what, what was that? He said, it's a sad story. 
the mother worked at a hospital, and she had brought home some powerful cleansing agents, like Fasolex, in a medicine bottle. And she had become ill. She was in the hospital when this happened. The little boy, the daddy was taking care of the little boy, and the little boy had an upset stomach. And the daddy just saw that medicine, you know, he thought it was something like Kelpectate or Maalox, and he started giving that to that little boy. Powerful cleansing agent. It was in a medicine bottle, and the little guy would immediately throw it up. Well, he'd give him more, and he'd throw it up. Long story short, when they got the little fellow to the hospital, it was too late. He died. Now, I can tell you something to me, and I, I didn't know those folks. Man, I grieved for them for days, not even knowing. But I'll tell you something to me that's sadder than that. And that's for people to walk up to the day of judgment and hear the Lord say, I never knew you. But Lord, I prophesied in your name. In your name I cast out demons. In your name I did many wonderful and mighty works. I was your servant. I was a Christian. I was a child of God. I never knew you. Because they gave you the wrong medicine. They gave you the doctrines of men instead of my word. You were not doing the will of my Father who is in heaven. That to me is an eternal tragedy. For good people, sincere, honest people that want to know what to do to be saved, some zealous person says, well, you accept Jesus as your personal Savior and pray this sinner's prayer. Now, where in the world did you get that? Out of the Bible. Yeah, it had to be out of the Bible because it's not in the Bible. And how many sincere people are going to be literally shocked? And, and I don't want that. I don't want people to be lost. I don't want the Lord to say, I never knew you. And you have an eternity awaiting you in a horrible place. I don't want that for people. But I read Matthew 7 and Jesus said that's the way it's going to be for some folks. They were given the wrong medication spiritually. Not given the word of God. We must handle aright the word of truth. Now, just to show you, keep looking here at 2 Timothy 2.15. He says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing, or handling aright the word of truth. And avoid vain babblings and profane things. This will increase to more ungodliness. And then he starts talking about two fellows. He said... Uh, don't follow the words of Hymenaeus and Philetus who have erred concerning the truth. And we can do that, obviously. They have erred concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is past already. Now, are you ready for the real shocker? And overthrow the faith of some. Man, I would hate to face somebody in the day of judgment whose faith I had overthrown. Now back in chapter 1, he talks about Alexander and uh, his companion whose faith had been made shipwrecked. He said, Hymenaeus and Alexander, their faith is shipwrecked. Have you ever known a person that lost their faith? Have you ever known a person that lost faith that God was even real? Became, they thought, an atheist. Have you ever known a person that lost faith that Jesus is the Son of God? Haven't we all met people like that? But I'll tell you something more serious than that, and that's overthrowing the faith of people. You know, there was a time when God's people had been taught the truth about the undenominational nature of the church revealed in the New Testament that Jesus said He would build. And for people to come along in our day 
and overthrow that faith. I'm telling you something that's happening, folks. That's serious business. And there are going to be some people that are going to have to face that Lord who died to make His church a living reality. They're going to have to face that Lord having overthrown the faith of some people. We have to handle the word of truth aright. We have to be very careful how we handle it. You know, back a few years ago, there were some brethren that thought we needed what they called a new hermeneutic. That old approach, that's, that won't do it anymore. Got to have a new approach. Got to have a new hermeneutic. And so they set, sea, set to sea on that sea of subjectivity with no shoreline and nothing to chart the course. So who knows where we're going. When people lose faith, that's sad, but when they destroy the faith of other people, that is a tragedy. That is an eternal tragedy. And God deliver His church today from those who are trying to destroy it to make a new denomination. That's happening. Now the first effort to build a denomination came in the first century. When there were some people that heard the gospel and evidently obeyed it. They were believers. I'm in Acts 15 now. And they had a meeting of the apostles and elders to receive information from the Holy Spirit as to the true status of Gentile Christians because these fellows were going to form a new denomination. They were going to say it's not enough to be a Christian. You're going to have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. It's all written right there in Acts 15. And they were perverting the gospel. That was not true. And they were troubling congregations in Galatia and other places with their new denomination. The world is burdened with denominationalism. We must be very careful how we handle the word of truth. Now, I've thought with you about appreciation for the opportunity of being a servant of God. We've been thinking about the truth to guide us in that area to tell us what to do, and even why to do it, the motivation. And now quickly in the third place, I want us to think in terms of the application. Applying that truth. Applying that truth, for example, in the area of salvation. If I were asked, can you give a one-word sum summary of the Bible, it probably would be salvation. I, I depend on James there. Receive with me this then grafted or implanted word, which is able to save your soul. That's it, salvation. And salvation, as all of you know, has two dimensions. There is a present salvation, like in Ephesians 2, when Paul said, by grace you are saved. Right then they were saved. There is an eternal salvation, 1 Peter 1, 5. That's to be revealed when Jesus comes. We don't even know the full nature of that salvation, that eternal dimension of it. Oh, we can... We can dream about it, and we can look at a few little windows into the nature of it. But if you were happy that day that the Lord saved you, when you had believed with all of your being that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that faith had led you to repent, change your mind about the way you had lived and the way you would live with Jesus not only as your Savior, but also as your Lord and you sweetened your lips with his precious name, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you were baptized, just like the Scripture teaches, believing with all of your heart that that was going to put you into relationship with Jesus Christ, wherein and whereby you would become a child of God, and therefore an heir of God, and a joint heir with the Son of God. And you were baptized. Were you happy? Was there joy? Brother, there was in my heart. I'll never forget what they started singing. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice. 
on Thee, my Savior and my God. Well, may this glowing heart rejoice until its rapture is all abroad. Happy day! Now, if you thought you knew what happiness was, just wait until the Lord reveals the eternal dimension of salvation. Isn't that what Peter said, 1 Peter 1, 5, you're kept with the power of God unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Now you talk about joy and happiness that will not end just the moment you and I experience seeing our Savior. And the moment you and I know the joy of being in the presence of Almighty God. And the moment that we are sure now we are with the redeemed of all the ages forever and forever in a beautiful land on the faraway strand that's now a reality to us where death will never come, where sorrow will never be known, where pain and suffering of heart or body will never be experienced, but joy unspeakable and full of glory. The songs of the ransomed, the volume of which will be as the roar of many waters and the beauty as harpers harping with their harps, and it'll never, ever end. Revelation of eternal salvation, all because of a merciful God, a God of all grace, as Peter said in 1 Peter 5 and 10, and the Lord Jesus Christ loving us enough to leave the beauty and security of heaven and come to this earth and identify with us to know what it's really like to struggle here against the devil and all of his forces and all of his demons, and then for my Savior to go out to Golgotha and to be brutally traumatized in a crucifixion after they had beaten him the way you would beat an animal, for my Savior to do that for me, I don't deserve that, but I love him for it, loving me that much. And to be with him, to just be with him, and to try to thank him for eternity. I love you so much for coming and loving me, leaving all the beauty of heaven to come to this earth to take me to glory. And, and Lord, I'll ever be in your debt. I praise God for you forever. Eternal salvation. And that's the revelation. Immediate, present salvation with all of its joy. The peace it brings, the guilt it takes away of our conscience. The happiness it instills within our souls. And then the anticipation of that eternal salvation that God's people will enjoy forever and forever. So, I find my place to serve I serve as best I can, and to God be the glory for the opportunity, and that makes life worthwhile. So when I look at this passage, you look at your opportunity here, brother, uh, appreciate the privilege of being a servant of God, working for the Lord. And you're handling the truth that tells you how to do that, and what to do, and why to do it. Be real careful how you handle that truth, because you don't want to disturb it, you don't want to distort it in any way. And then don't ever forget that as long as you are there in that service, that there's joy that comes to your soul now, just seeing, taking the Word of God and touching somebody's life for good. Having somebody to come to you and say, you saved my life. They're talking about their physical life. Those of you that have had that experience, uh, it, it's hard to really explain what that does inside of you. You saved my life. I'm more important that your soul will be saved forever. I want to thank you brethren again for the opportunity. You know, this I look forward to this every year. I know the day is coming when 
you know, this old fellow, you won't have a time for me. I, I understand that. It's the way life goes. But I'll tell you one thing. When I'm sitting there in that recliner or wherever they have me, where the, wherever the kids have me, I think about, well, I remember some Saturdays. I could go down to Pulaski and get with the best people on earth and we could sing together and I could hear Brother Dan Winkler present those great lessons from the Word of God and man, those were great moments in my life. So I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to seize the golden moment and enjoy it to the fullest of my ability. Thank you so much for your good attention. Rise up, old man.